I went to Chicago in 2005 to do my master's, uh, and I did that at Roosevelt University. Mm -hmm. I studied with Richard Stilwell uh, for two years of my master's, and then I also stayed there for two more years, which was an artist diploma, and I, I studied with Richard Stilwell another two years. Um, and during that time, uh, Chicago Opera Theatre would use their artist diploma students um, as covers and um, and chorus, just like any other um, young artist program in the States. Um, and between 2007 and 2009, I did apprenticeships with Opera Santa Barbara, Des Moines Opera, uh, Chicago Opera Theater was part of the diploma program. That was two seasons and also Santa Fe, two seasons. Mm -hmm. um, I moved to Berlin in 2009 uh, to do a stipendium, which is a young artist uh, training program with Deutsche Oper Berlin and also with um, Teatro Reggio Torino. Okay. And um, that was a, that's called the, the Opera Foundation. Um, and so that was, that was in thanks to them. And during that year, I did 46 performances with uh, Deutsche Oper Berlin, and I did 18 performances with uh, Teatro Reggio Torino. So that was a very busy season. And then, I went, to, and then I went to Heidelberg for a year, uh, officially as fast, and then five years in Karlsruhe fast. And then I had two seasons. Uh, this season and last season were part-time mm -hmm. with Wuppertal. So I got um, just a partial, a partial season contract. And so sometimes when voices are more um, specialized voices, they get hired just for um, more than one project, but just for a specific time. Oh, so okay. both yeah. times during the fall until uh, December, January, February, um, that's where my entire season existed. Uh -huh. So I did a bunch of projects that were relevant to my voice. Um, and then I could go off to, to other companies and do other things. Um, and then, so coming up in the future, in September, I'll be doing Wotan in Die Valkyrie with uh, Theater Magdeburg, mm -hmm. which is about an hour and a half outside of, of Berlin mm -hmm. with the train. And um, so I'll be doing that in September, and that goes almost until December, and then in uh, in May, May 3rd, we open Don Giovanni at Tulsa, Tulsa Opera, and I'll be doing Don Giovanni, and that'll be my main stage debut in the U.S. That's awesome. I was thrilled to see that. Troll. I'm, I'm very happy to be there, and I'm, of course, of course, I'm, I'm happy to go to a more conservative place and go, hey, look, here's some good art, and it happens to be by by a person who you may not have considered could be uh, a professional in this field. Right. And I, I think that it brings representation to a community. Yeah. And I think especially people who are in um, more conservative states who are having a harder time, it means even more to them to see somebody you know, mo but most of the states around there, you know, they're fairly conservative. And I, I think it's good to have um, queer and trans representation there. I, I agree. And that, that leads me kind of to, to the second question is, what has <laughs> been the most challenging part of transitioning after your career was already going? Was that a difficult thing? Or? I've done a lot of things with my, I'm very much a binary person in my life. My my career and my continuing to sing baritone may may confuse some people, but really <laughs> but but really I'm very binary mm -hmm. in 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 my life. And I've done um I've done many many um I've been on quite a medical journey. Right. And none of those things really have had a huge effect on any of that and I, I definitely wouldn't say that 
even if any of those had an effect, that they they were a serious effect. I think the biggest the biggest challenge of my transition is is convincing people that all of this transition stuff doesn't have an effect on my art. Right. That's probably the hardest thing. And in doing so, I, I do put a lot of pressure on myself to be as good as I can be. Right. Uh, so I think, I mean, it's partially myself, but I, I want to show how solid I am as a performer. I am more solid now than I have ever been as a performer. And I... I, I feel that the, the proving is is probably the most challenging part right. is to really feel like there's always uh, a microscope and anybody who's ever worked a job and in, in transition or or if they're queer and you know there's for every anybody in any minority group right whether whether people want to admit it or not, they have an extra magnifying glass on them. Right. And for every single uh, minority group that they are a part of, the intersectionality, it makes it that much more difficult. Right. And so um, in my case, I mean, I don't, have, I don't have that many things really going against me, um, but being trans is, is difficult. Uh, in in a workplace context, mm -hmm. and also being an immigrant, being an being an immigrant, being a person who's taking away a German job, mm -hmm. and then also being trans, that's you know that's it makes you feel like you're proving yourself a lot, and I'm sure that there are a lot of people, um, especially people who are in a new country. I'm, I'm sure that people feel like that a lot. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure that trans people who come out, they could be doing, you know, the same job one day to the next, but they came out. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, you know, they had been just going through their job, no problems, nothing at all. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're getting written up for silly little things. Yeah. For being late or for whatever. Right. Or, or directly challenging their identity, you know, like not adhering to the dress code mm -hmm. or bathroom things. Right. And it's like, okay, well, you, you are directly attacking their identity. Yeah. So, you know, um, the, that's tricky. But, but I think that for me personally, I put a lot of stress on myself so that my art can't really be picked apart. Yeah. Uh, so that sort of led me to what has been the most surprising part of working with your conductors and your colleagues and where you are. Has there been something surprising about being able to transition and be trans in the opera world there? I was, I was surprised about how polarizing it would be. Oh. Because, because just in general, um, people like me or they don't like me. Mm -hmm. There aren't people who are like, <laughs> and and maybe maybe it, it took you know from from the people who who like me a little bit more than they don't like me and people who don't like me a little bit more than they like me it just like widened that out like crazy oh. and so um the people who support me they see when people don't support me or when they're are mean or aggressive or whatever and the people who don't like me really don't like me. Mm -hmm. Luckily, um, in the cases with uh, colleagues, directors, conductors, um, people who are really directly, um, in my experience, have been overwhelmingly nice. Great. I can only say that there was, there was one conductor um, that specifically had a problem mm -hmm. with with me pr that was pretty clear that it was based on identity right um you know there were conductors who i worked with before and after and directors who i worked with before and after who were who were just fine either way but generally we were on we were already on good good terms right um about being polarizing mm -hmm. is 
I get less auditions now. But, but the auditions that I do get, they're not informative auditions. I'm never going for a cattle call audition. Oh. When I show up, nobody's like, oh, wait, which baritone is this and shuffling papers? <laughs> right. No, they, they know who I am. Yeah. And they gave me an audition on purpose. I do more meaningful auditions. I do less of them, but they, they mean more. So, so that's, that shows that your level of success has risen substantially, well, right? I, I guess. But maybe, maybe, it, maybe it's that. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm not giving that the credit mm -hmm. that it needs. But I just sort of think of it as, okay, uh, you know, if my, if, my, if my agent is talking with the house about me and they're like, oh, yeah, Lucia, you know, she's singing... She's singing that. She's singing Giovanni or she's singing Votan coming up. And they're like, Lucia, wh wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever experienced voice dysphoria? Singing baritone and, and being in the binary? Well, um, when, when I came out, I think that next week I had three or four shows. Mm -hmm. So um, now all of a sudden everybody knew but I still had to do these characters that I did last week that I had no problem with. Right. So I had no break to stop and think about it. Mm -hmm. I've heard, I've heard of people who they associate their jobs, not, not singing or acting, but like they associate their jobs with masculinity and then they come out and then they really don't want to do that job anymore. Right. Fortunately, I guess I had a bunch of shows just in the next week yeah. and I didn't think about it and I didn't process it. I didn't go through any sort of, anything mentally at all okay i just sort of shut everything out and just did it yeah and that probably while it may not have been technically healthy mm -hmm. it was a way for me to just break through that wall immediately and not even acknowledge it right so once i did it i said okay and then i and then i get done and i take off my my costume my makeup and then i you know put on my regular face and I go to the cantina and I, and I hang out with my colleagues and it's fine. And then I go, okay, no, I can handle this. This is fine. Yeah. Um, but I didn't, I didn't build it up to be anything more than it could be. Right. I mean, I didn't even acknowledge it really. Right. I just did it. As far as, uh, speaking of dysphoria, when, um, normally when I'm not working on a role, my, my voice will sit higher right now. Um, like yesterday, the, the last two days before today, I ran through Votan. Oh, wow. uh, and so my voice, my voice has to sit in a place daily where um, I have access to all my notes. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of where my voice normally sits. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm in, in a project, maybe it sits a little bit higher when I'm, when I'm outside of a project. Mm -hmm. um, but my mannerisms and the amount of air that I add to my speaking voice, I'm pretty happy with where it is. Mm -hmm. And I don't get, I hate the word, but I don't get read that much in right. public. Yeah. Um, on the phone, it's, I, I do have to sort of tweak it up. Yeah. Um, but, but in person, people are just like, oh, wow, your voice is like really deep or low. They go, oh, I sing opera. And then they go, oh, okay. <laughs> like that covers it. No, no, no. That's it. Like, I mean, my my wife, she's in contralto. My yeah. my voice is, of course, lower than hers. <laughs> and my yeah. speaking voice is definitely lower than hers. Yeah. But when but when I say, oh yeah, people are like, oh your voice, and I go, I sing opera. Mm -hmm. Like, oh okay. And then like the matter is settled. Yeah. If there was any question in their mind, then they don't worry about it anymore. I've been fortunate enough to have uh, facial feminization surgery. So when people look at me, when people look at my face, it's not, it's not so much of a question mark in their mind. Right. Because I think that when people are subconsciously reading people, you know, they go, it's, it's about taking everything in. And so while my voice is a little bit lower, I think that a lot of other things are, don't, don't trigger a question mark right 
Um, I I am I am bigger and I'm tall. I'm I'm six foot. Oh yeah. But but um, you know I've had almost four years on HRT and I have hips. Yeah. And my like I have a shape to my my body, which which is fortunate because everybody right. everybody is different. Everybody has different ge- genetics. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that I have enough. I don't know. I guess voice dysphoria is is a thing mm-hmm. um, that I don't deal with. <laughs> I experience, but I don't really deal with it because. I can't get into it that far and be able to do my job. Exactly. Yeah. So now a normal thing that my wife and I do is we go to the sauna and you know, everybody's naked and it's no big deal. Yeah. And um, I've been, well, fortunate enough to, to be able to do certain things so that I don't stand out. <laughs> There. And I yeah. and I go to and I go to Frauentag and nobody says anything and nobody has a problem and it's it's very so I, I, I experience on one hand maybe I experience some voice dysphoria but I I don't worry about it because I've got these other things right. that like I can go to Frauentag and nobody like it's not a thing right I don't I don't read even being naked I don't read as trans right. so. When you take everything together, and you know it's 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 nobody's business right. um, what's under your clothes, and there's it's nobody's business about your your medical history, and and I I I guess I divulge I'm more free with that information because I want to go look. There's a lot of things possible. It's none of your business, though. Yeah. Like I share, I share my experiences, and I share my experiences on my blog, because because there is a curiosity, right. and I think that if you take people's questions and you go, look, your question's not okay. Here's some examples. Here's something with me that I am freely sharing with you that is none of your business. Right. <laughs> but here's but 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 here's something. Yeah. Because I think if you dispel these things, eventually people go, yeah, what? Yeah. I have business cards, and they're primarily used for for my business. You know, if I if I meet a director or conductor or whatever, you know, I can give them my card. Mm-hmm. And usually they're like, oh, you have cards. I don't have a card. <laughs> <And then laughs> because. Because it's not it's not a typical thing. Because artists are different about stuff, right. and and people don't worry about that. But when you have a card, it's sort of nice. But what I've used this card for before is so in the German media, I get I get recognized because I've been on TV right. five or six different times, and then those get re-aired. And then I've also had different magazines and stuff like that that I've I've been on and in. Mm-hmm. And sometimes somebody will come up to me and they'll just start talking to me about really uh, personal stuff. And then I'll go, you know, I actually wrote... So this is also sort of protecting me. I go, you know, actually I have a blog and um, I wrote about some stuff. And here's my card. And... Once you've read through that stuff, if you want to send me an email, my email is right here. Yeah. But what it does is it diffuses this thing. Yeah. It takes a it takes a curious person and doesn't turn them off. Right. To to me or to trans people or to whatever. Right. It doesn't say, "Look, you are inappropriate. You can't do this." It doesn't right. point the finger. It goes, "Look, there are answers if you really want to get in there. You can get in there in your own leisure. <laughs> I don't have to waste my time. You don't have to waste." my time (laughs) no but it's like but it's like look i I, i'm sure you're curious i've written a lot about this yeah feel free to read it on my site and then if you want to email me some stuff email me some stuff yeah yeah i mean for 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 trans people especially trans performers i'm my email is very public and anybody who wants to contact me can contact me um i've been in in contact with a lot of different educators Mm -hmm. just to sort of uh, tell my own version and my own thoughts on stuff. Yeah. And 
do you want to give at this point advice to any young trans singers that are out there considering classical music as an option or not? <laughs> um, sure. If you don't have, if you want to do arts and you don't have a supportive family or another income stream, it's going to be hard to realize um, a career that will sustain you financially. Mm -hmm. I cannot, I cannot tell you how hard it is if, if you make it. So if you make it, whatever you consider making this, right. and if you're an opera singer and you consider Met, singing at the Met to be the only way that you can make it, then you're setting yourself up for heartache. Right. Um, there's a lot of different ways to participate in the music business mm -hmm. and being an artist is one of the one of the financially most difficult ways. Yeah. Um, you know there there are chorus positions mm -hmm. that pay you a steady income. There are uh, there are orchestra gigs that pay you a steady income, but in the states those are really really hard to get. If you're in Germany and and let's let's say you're you're, you're a German citizen and, and you've gone through their system. If you come out of school and you want to sing in a chorus, you can. Yeah. You don't get to choose where that is. You might have to move, mm -hmm. but but you probably can make that happen. Right now, being an artist in the states is is really really tricky. So that's one of the reasons why I'm here. I mean, also specifically because of Wagner stuff. I, I, I needed to speak German. I needed to get this education. And now I'm, you know, I've done, I've done Wagner roles before, but doing Wotan is sort of a way to show, look, this is what I've been doing. Right. And this is what I've been working towards. And this is why I came here. Right. Um, if, if you are trans, you have to be better than everybody. Sorry, you do. You have to be better than everybody. And and maybe, you know, maybe in 20 years and 30 years, it's not going to be uh, a mark against you. Right. But right now, it is. If you're the best, you, you might be able to make a career. Yeah. But... Even if you are, even if you aren't trans, and you're trying to make a career in here, and you make it, you you're not making a lot of money, right. and and unless you're singing at only the biggest houses, you're probably spending a lot of that money to go around and do auditions and right. whatever. So there will um, be there will be voice teachers in this session that we're talking about training trans singers who don't work right. with opera singers who work with just you know casual or amateur right. singers, um, but they have a lot of questions about what they should what they should be thinking about when that when I, when they're presented right. with a trans singer. Is there do you have anything yeah. for these teachers out there? Yeah, you have you have voices that have dropped and voices that haven't dropped. And then you have voices that haven't settled yet. So if, if there's somebody and they just started taking testosterone, well, their voice may be a little bit unstable and, and then it will eventually stabilize. But to say that, I don't know, just to say, oh, well, there are trans voices. <laughs> well, it's not like you have, you have, you know, Soprano and mezzo soprano, and then you have tenor and bass, and then you have like this third category that Trans all of the voices fit into. No, <laughs> not at all. Right. And you know, you you can have you can have somebody who trains. Uh, you know, they 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 were a baritone, you know, and now they're training to be a mezzo or or something like that. I don't know the specifics of that, but I've heard enough voices to know that going going both ways, I've heard cis women 
who can sing a pretty hefty tenor, right? Like full lyric tenor, and not, and and I could hear a recording of it and not know right. that it's a cis woman. Yeah. And then I've also heard, um, heard heard the other way, mm-hmm. um, or and and people who sing mezzo right. or something like that sing in the tenor range as a tenor. Yeah. And. You, you can't hear the difference right. and also going going the other way you know somebody who sings who sings baritone and then they're singing let's say mezzo yeah but they have uh, refined that head voice so much that it it speaks as clear as any other mezzo right and to just put that down to uh whatever they have medically going on no like there's there's a lot of training yeah. uh, to go with with genetics yeah so and like i said i don't want to take anything away from anybody who's studying this stuff this right. is important this is really really important um i would i would try and if you were if you were a singing teacher please try and make it as simple as possible don't Thank don't you. don't overcomplicate it yeah because yes, there's research in that stuff. There, there are people doing that research. Yeah. And if you are a doctoral student and if you're doing a, a thesis on something, that's fantastic. Please explore that stuff. If you are a high school teacher, please don't get into the inner workings of trans voices on the student who just came out. Right. Please keep it simple. Yeah. And you know, if their voice is changing, great. Have them stand over here. If you have a choir, don't don't be like, well, no, you have to wear a dress because you're over on this side. No, do the do the like soprano bass tenor alto thing so that you can like put people on the sides, you know, and then they can wear whatever choir uniform is appropriate and sing whatever voice part they're singing with. Exactly. Totally. I get it. I, I get asked all the time about trans voices, like there's one kind of trans voice or like there's right one repertoire or one thing and i keep saying there's as many different kinds of trans voices as there are in any population so you can't generalize yeah if you want to say trans voices like (laughs) what's that mean yeah (laughs) okay um (laughs) i can guarantee you that if you were trans you were not just going to end up with the voice that i have right (laughs) if you use head voice and chest voice that's way better than saying than saying falsetto. Okay. Because if you say head voice, it's covered, really. Right. And and if you're working with with a trans feminine performer, they're gonna appreciate that. Yeah. It's gonna mean a lot to them, and it's going to be uh, a clue in, not a dog whistle because it's positive, but like it's going to clue them in, like, okay, here's somebody who is careful enough with their language that they do respect me. Right. And that's the whole, that's the whole thing is if if you make somebody if you go out of your way to make somebody else comfortable mm-hmm. they will know that you care. Right. You don't have to say I care. Right. I respect you. <laughs> right. If you just respect me then I know. Right. And I know that it's for real. Right. That's awesome. Um, yeah, so so I love I love head voice and 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 chest voice because Okay, I sing I sing baritone, mostly held in baritone, and yes, I sing in my my chest yes, voice please. as basically. Yeah. But if I'm singing in contralto stuff, I don't see it as a falsetto. Or the at least the aim that I'm going for, even if physically inside of inside of me the exact same thing is happening for falsetto Mm -hmm. i'm not training it to sound like that Mm -hmm. and i don't want it to sound like that i mean if i if i want to train to be a countertenor then okay fine but i think you can train voices to do a lot of really different things and if we're not talking about about classical technique and we're talking about um, you know, jazz or musical theater or something like that. Th- that's also a completely different technique, right. you know? And um, I think that 
I think that, you know, voices naturally sit in one sort of area. And if you're training a voice outside of that area, you can, you can, and I'm not even saying that you shouldn't, you should, you should do whatever you, you want to do. Um, but you, you should be aware where your voice sits. But as an educator, if you force somebody to sing in that area because, well, that's your natural voice, well, the student may not return right. if they're a private student. Right. And if, if they're at a school, maybe they'll try and get away because it's not creating, that is not creating a good, a good learning environment right. for them. Right. If, if you have a student at your university and they want to be a professional opera singer and, but they only want to sing with their head voice and their head voice is not developing, you know, the way that they want it to, there needs to be a conversation there. Right. And I would say, let, let the student tell you where they want to sing. Yep. But you have to be honest with the student. And if, if, if the sound that they are making up in their head voice, specifically like trans women singers, if they're not making a professional sound up there, they need to listen to it too. There needs to be a lot of recording right. and listening because they need to hear it because whatever you hear in your head while you're singing is not accurate, you know, um, but you, you have to be honest with, with your singer and say, look, we can train this. This is, especially if they're a private student, if they want to train, whatever they want to train, then that's what they want to train. Right. And if you want to be part of that, you don't have to be part of that. Recommend them to somebody else. <laughs> yeah. That's fine. Don't, don't force them to do something. Um, if you're in a school situation, then it's, you know, it's more tricky because you have rules working against you or for you, however you look at it. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's all about respect and honesty. And I think that that's, that's a difficult thing, though, in, in the educational world, if we're talking about universities, because you have people paying um, a lot of money to go there, and you can't, you know, you have your own sets of rules that you have to work by, you know, they have to have a certain amount of rep ready for a recital, right. or you, you have all sorts of different, different rules. Um, I, I, I had a friend in, in, in grad school and she was like, I know that I'm not singing after this. I know that this isn't going to be my profession, yeah. but she wanted the degree. Yeah. But you know, that was an informed decision. But as, as a teacher, if, if there's any way that you can talk to your student and go, look, I know what you want, but this is not going to get you there. Yeah. But, but if you're training somebody, like let's hear concurrently training somebody as uh, with their baritone voice and their contralto voice, let's say. Mm -hmm. If their contralto voice is not a professional voice, but their baritone voice is or could be, it's good to tell them this. Yeah. Look, how, how important is it to you that you play women on stage? And if that's really, really important to you and your 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 head voice your contralto voice is not professional level quality you know do you want to be like a straight theater actor right because that that's going to be um probably easier to work on mm -hmm. is the speaking voice yeah. and you're probably doing it in in everyday life anyway right uh, i i definitely think that it's possible for for trans women to sing legitimate mezzo or, or contralto. Um, but I think that if you do, you might want to present yourself as cis to the opera industry. Oh. I know somebody I will never say who it is. Right. There is somebody in the business um, who's contralto or a mezzo. I think she's mezzo. And she's talked to me and she's like, should I come out? I'm like, 
She's not at the top. If she right. was like at the mat or something like that. You could say, yeah, like, go ahead. Come on out. <laughs> yeah, fine. No, but like she doesn't experience any pushback from the business because the business doesn't know. Wow. So it's not that you, if you are a trans woman and you sing mezzo or contralto, um, it may be worth engineering things, you know, through an artist name or, or an actual name change mm -hmm. um, to try and present as cis, yeah. Yeah. like stealth in the business, mm -hmm. at least yeah. for, for a matter of time, because I think that the business will have a problem with that. Yeah. I know people who are, who are non-binary, who are doing auditions and they get weird pushback. Yeah. Uh, from from the business um anyway that's a whole bunch of random stuff i but, love it it's uh, awesome have, have fun editing <laughs> that'll be the hardest part of this job you've been so generous i really appreciate this i i hope this is helpful it is I, helpful I, it's awesome and i'm you're just it's so much fun to get to talk to you after reading so much about you for i don't know maybe i maybe i overshare a little bit but but if, if you're trans and you're upset about my sharing, understand that I'm I'm doing this to protect somebody else. Right. I'm giving answers to these questions that no, nobody deserves an answer to. No, I don't have to educate anybody on this. Right. But what I am doing is I am choosing to share and sometimes overshare so that you know this you know, trans girl who's 16 years old, who just came out, who doesn't even know what they want to do when they grow up right. or what the major is going to be in college. Like they don't need these questions. They don't need questions about what surgeries they're going to have and what, it, like all this stuff. It's nobody's business. Right. And me going through such a theater life, I'm, I'm more equipped to give people answers or tell people no yeah instead of just like okay there's somebody asking me questions i feel like i have to tell them right. you know yeah i feel like i can moderate that a lot better than somebody who's just come out yeah totally. and that's how i do it yeah totally okay, i hope this is helpful and um please let let people know that um, they're free to contact me. My my email address is out there. The the one that you have is my email address that I use for everything. That's awesome. Um, especially trans performers. Um, yeah, I, I I want to help people. I like helping people. It's something that I enjoy. So okay, all right. We'll talk to you later. I hope. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.